There's a consistent tension in legal practice that I've noticed, and it's this. Just because you can do something, does that mean you should be doing that thing? That's the topic of today. My name is Chris Hargraves, and this is the Tips for Lawyers podcast, episode number 30. That means you can get the show notes or anything else you need from tipsforlawyers.com slash podcast slash 30. And if I mention links, which I probably will this time, and other resources, then I'll link them up there. Uh, And when I get around to doing a transcript, that'll also be available there if you prefer to read or have it downloaded. So... Before we get into that today, I did just want to mention something I've been trying out recently, uh, and in a sense this is playing to my strengths, so it is relevant, but if you're listening to a podcast, I assume uh, you have a few minutes now and then to uh, put some earphones in and actually listen to something. I'm assuming most of you aren't probably uh, listening to this at your desktop at work and might be listening to it on the bus or wherever, uh, some form of commute. And one of the things I've tried recently, and I resisted it for a long time out of a sense of traditionalism, but I have been, in fact, trying out audiobooks, and I'm actually really enjoying them. So, uh, look, if you've not tried out audiobooks, they're pretty easy. Uh, most of you probably have access to iTunes, uh, and most of you have probably used Amazon before, but you might not have used Audible before, and that's where I've been getting my audiobooks from, mostly because it's the only one I know about. I'm sure there's others and there's other ways of doing it, but uh, they have a pretty good repository and you can sign up for free and try them out for uh, a couple of free books in the first month. After that, it's around $15 US a month and you can get one book each month. Obviously, you can pay for some beyond that, but uh, there is a subscription thing that you can do if you want to. But if you wanted to try them out, uh, I'll link that up in the show notes at tipsforlawyers.com slash podcast slash 30, or uh, if you want to go straight there, I'll by the time you get this, have created a link. Just to straight, take you straight there, you can go to tisforlawyers.com slash go, G-O slash audible, and that will take you over to Audible where you can sign up. Uh, I should say that'll probably be an affiliate link once I uh, figure out how much uh, effort I need to put in to get that link, which means I'll get a very, very small um, amount of money even if you sign up for the free one. Uh, if you prefer to avoid that, just uh, go to Google and type in Audible, uh, and that'll get you there as well. So give it a go. Let me know what you think. I've been enjoying them. Uh, The quality varies, I must say. Uh, Some of them are better than others. I prefer the ones that are actually read out by their authors rather than ones that are done by way of a performance. Don't know why, I just appreciate that authenticity um, that I can be pretty confident it's coming out the way the person who actually wrote it anticipated. So that's all I had by way of introduction today and uh, really today we're talking about strengths and weaknesses, but I'm couching it in a slightly different term, which is can versus should. And in particular, this comes up in legal practice in a number of areas. Uh, I have this conversation fairly regularly with my assistant uh, and occasionally with junior solicitors, and sometimes we agree and sometimes we disagree, and generally I come out better out of that discussion, although not always, I must admit. So what are we talking about? The reality is this, uh, that within the confines of legal practice, you can do a lot of things. I'll give you some examples. You know, for example, how to use a hole punch. Uh, You know how to use a stapler. You know how to uh, stick bits of paper on the fronts of files. You also probably know how to type. I suspect you know how to send emails. I suspect you might know how to use a fax machine, although I'm sure there's some of you who do not. You probably know how to use a scanner and various other tasks that are done on a daily basis. Now, the question becomes this. Just because you can do those things, ought you be doing them? And it's a difficult question because sometimes you face some opposition uh, when you try to delegate things. In particular, someone goes, well, why can't you just do that yourself? Um, Sometimes you do have a tendency uh, to avoid that battle And I understand this if you are facing a battle with a particular individual or a particular category of person where you are trying uh, to shed yourself of those tasks and you are having trouble doing it. And at the end of the day, you just can't be bothered having the argument. And so you end up doing yourself. Now, that is a dangerous trap. 
and I'm not unsympathetic to the situation because I have seen it and I have come across it and I have experienced it where something just needs to be done. You don't have the time or the energy or the inclination to have a battle for that thing to be done and so you just end up doing it yourself. And that works that time and that might have been urgent enough that it was worth doing. But what happens the next time? Uh, it's sort of like the old adage, uh, and you might not appreciate this one necessarily, but uh, uh, for husbands who want to get out of doing the dishes, for example, or for that matter, wives who want to get out of doing the dishes or any other category of task, all you've got to do is do it badly enough, often enough, and eventually the other person will get sick of asking you to do it and uh, they will take it back and do it properly. Now, it's essentially the same, which is just because you can do it, you need to ask yourself whether you should. And it comes down to the question of prioritization, uh, which in itself is relevant to the question of leverage or delegation. Uh, and also by reference, it's relevant to profitability. So I've spoken about that before. It's not actually the topic of this particular podcast, but if you've heard anything I have to say or if you've taken the essentials course, uh, which you can find at tipsforlawyers.com slash essentials, then you will know that fundamentally that issue of leverage is one of the major components associated with profitability. And how it works essentially is that you deliver more value for less cost. And that's how leverage works. But it's also how sometimes you need to approach the issue of deciding whether you should be doing something just because you can. And it's a difficult decision sometimes. And the examples I gave before about cutting and pasting and copying and so on are essentially no brainers. I mean, those are the pretty easy ones, but it does get more complex, especially when you're delegating with other professional staff. Uh, deciding what level of seniority should do things, uh, deciding whether you should make a call yourself or have a junior solicitor do that. Sometimes research might need to be done by various levels of people and sometimes letters might need to be written or memoranda done. And there is actually a fine balancing act in terms of who should be doing something. Today, though, I wanted to focus not necessarily on the aspect of delegation, but in fact on the aspect of strengths. Because within your own practice area and within your own particular passions and desires and skill set, you will have some areas where you excel and you'll have other areas where you do not excel. So today I just wanted to run you through a few examples uh, and I'm in fact using myself as the guinea pig. So uh, for those of you who might listen to this and wonder where I pull some of these examples from sometimes, this one is all about me. Uh, I generally try not to do that, but uh, I know myself the best. And not too long ago now, although a little bit longer, um, towards the end of 2014, I took the uh, Gallup Strengths Finder test. And I don't know whether you've seen that one. I will link it up in the show notes because I thoroughly recommend it as a way of helping you to identify your areas of strength and by inference, the areas in which you can offer the most value uh, where you can provide the most contribution, but also the where areas where you perhaps offer less value. Uh, and perhaps there might be a little bit of insight here about some things that you are doing or spending a lot of time on or focusing on or trying to work on that perhaps are not necessarily in your core skill set. So that's what I wanted to do today. Now, taking you through the entire uh, Strengths Finder test, uh, would be ridiculous because you can do the test yourself. What I wanted to give you an idea, though, of was the kinds of strengths. And uh, although, of course, every individual is unique, I wanted to give you an idea of what we're actually looking for here, what kind of information we're looking for, and how we can go about applying that. So when you take the Strengths Finder test, you have a set of questions that you need to answer. Now, don't do what I did and do this just before dinner uh, when your kids and your wife are waiting for you because it's a timed test and you can't pause it. So if you do do the test, please bear in mind you can't pause it. I didn't know this uh, and it was the result of a certain amount of frustration in my household while I was trying to work through this while dealing with kids on the one hand. So whether these are representative of me or representative of me in that particular situation, I don't know. But after you take the test, it crunches the numbers, it crunches your answers. It's a very interesting format of test for those of you who've done psychology degrees. Like I have, the actual format is quite interesting in the way they ask the questions. But it 
churns out for you at the base level, which is all I got, I didn't get the full thing, it churns out for you your five top strengths out of a number that is identified as the core areas of strength for certain people. And for me, those five areas came out as strategic, achiever, arranger, learner, and responsibility. Now, I don't know why responsibility isn't an er like everything else is, but that's just what they decided to name it. And what that helped me do, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail so you understand what those actually mean, what that helped me do was self-assess a little bit better about how do those things align with what I actually do on a day-to-day basis. Because if those are correct, and obviously you can't assume that, but given the extent Dent of the test, uh, most people I've spoken to about this, it does come out to be relatively accurate. Most people are pretty comfortable that it's an accurate reflection of their strengths. And those are the top five, and those are in order uh, for me from one to five. It gives you an idea of what perhaps you should be culling from your day-to-day practice, or at least minimizing your exposure to, and what you should be maximizing your exposure to. Now, my view is that you should be maximizing your strengths. I know there are people who think you should be working on your weaknesses to become well-rounded. I don't necessarily accept that proposition. I accept that there are some areas in which particular weaknesses might be detrimental and they need to at the very least be smoothed out or in some way managed, but I'm not convinced that there is in fact benefit in a significant amount of devotion towards improving areas where you are fundamentally weak, particularly these core characteristic areas. We're not talking about learning things here. We're talking about your core character and personality. So although your training will naturally have an impact upon those, it's not necessarily the case that you uh, will be able to work on all of your weaknesses to the extent that they become positive attributes in practice. So my view is that you should focus on your strengths and that you should endeavor to maximize your contribution through utilization of those strengths rather than to try and fix all of the things you're bad at within reason. If there's something that's significantly impacting upon you, you obviously need to work on it. But let's talk about strengths for the moment. So starting with just an idea of what you actually get. So I'm just reading from now one of the reports. It gives you an overall summary of these themes. They call them themes. And within strategic, what it says about strategic is that I am the kind of person who can sort through the clutter and find the best route. Now, What does that mean? It means that I can see patterns and scenarios and I can put them together and I can arrange a solution. And I think that's fairly uh, accurate. Um, All of these things, by the way, make you feel good about yourself. So don't worry about that. You'll come out feeling good about yourself no matter what the answers are. Um, They're phrased in great, uh, great explanations that actually give you a nice ego boost as well. The next one uh, for me was called Achiever. Now it says to me, the Achiever theme helps you explain your drive. Achiever describes a constant need for achievement. You feel as if every day starts at zero, and by the end of the day, you must achieve something tangible in order to feel good about yourself. And then it goes on to talk about that. Within Arranger, it says you are a conductor. When faced with a complex situation involving many factors, you enjoy managing all of the variables, aligning and realigning them until you are sure you have arranged them in the most productive configuration possible. Now again, within the context of what I do, Uh, And within the context of where my strengths are, I think those three, uh, which are the top three, are particularly uh, accurate. Uh, I'm a litigation lawyer, and part of what I do in terms of large-scale strategic litigation is to draw the tendrils together um, to make sure A is working with B is working with C, and all of those are headed in the direction of D, which is our ultimate goal. So I think personally those are quite accurate. The last two are learner and responsibility. So you love to learn. The subject matter that interests you most will be determined by your other themes, which is the ones I've read out earlier. But whatever the subject, you'll always be drawn to the process of learning. And in a sense, that's why I read so much. It's why I went on about audiobooks before. There you go. There was relevance there. Um, I enjoy learning and I enjoy finding opportunities to learn. But I also enjoy opportunities to teach. And it's interesting that teaching wasn't necessarily in this particular skill set. The last one is responsibility. It says the responsibility theme forces you to take psychological ownership for anything that you commit to, whether large or small, you feel emotionally bound to follow it through to completion. And I found that one particularly interesting for a number of reasons. When I look back over the articles on tips for lawyers, I uh, find that I write a reasonable amount about people taking responsibility for their actions, about you taking control of your career, about you owning your mistakes 
uh, and admitting them where necessary. But ultimately, what Tips for Lawyers is about is about young lawyers taking responsibility for their careers and driving them and learning and understanding and implementing and acting. And in a sense, that responsibility theme comes out through there. So those are my five top strengths finder themes. And I just gave you a quick summary of those and a quick summary of why I did it and how you might apply it, because I think it's a valuable resource for every young professional to actually use. So go to tipsforlawyers.com slash podcast slash 30. Jump on uh, the link there to Strengths Finder. I don't think that's an affiliate link. I don't think it will be. I don't know of one. So don't worry about that if that's something that bothers you. And it's a fairly small investment and it will give you, I think, a pretty good insight to actually have some reflection, some introspection about your day and your week and your strategic plan and the area that you work in and really take some time to analyze those themes, satisfy yourself that they are accurate, satisfy yourself uh, that you took the test in a good frame of mind and perhaps that you weren't necessarily operating at peak capacity, but you really then need to take those answers and do something with them. It's all very well for me to say do this, but actually not give you any practical advice. And my practical advice is this, compare your theme to your professional life and your personal life for that matter, as it stands at the moment. And have a think about how the themes identified in the Strengths Finder test will affect what you do on a daily basis and whether perhaps you need to make some adjustments so that you are playing to your strengths rather than trying to cater to your weaknesses. There are ways of dealing with weaknesses, and that'll be the subject of another podcast, I'm sure, at some stage. But for now, have a look at the Strengths Finder test. Have a look at your top themes. If you don't want to take the Strengths Finder test or don't have the money to, that's fine. It's actually not very expensive. But if you're flat strapped, don't worry about that. At the very least, identify your two or three or four characteristic strengths and see how that aligns with what you do on a daily basis. Because if you are spending all day, every day, constantly battling your weaknesses rather than playing to your strengths, you're going to come out of every day and every week and every month exhausted. You're going to find far less joy and positivity in your career. And ultimately, you're going to be less successful because rather than operating in areas of peak performance, you're operating in areas of weak performance. So that is what I had to say today. Figure out What parts of your day are not catering to your strengths? Have a good think about it and see how you can make some modifications. It might involve delegating more. It might involve shedding some responsibilities so that you can focus on strong areas. It might involve a potential change in practice area. Now, I know that's a big call. I'm not suggesting you should do anything to get yourself fired or quit your job or anything lunatic, but you might want to consider how you can go about starting to massage, to reshape, your career to align with your strengths. And I think you will ultimately come out the better end of that equation if you start to do that today. This is the Tips for Lawyers podcast, episode 30. Check out the links at tipsforlawyers.com slash podcast slash 30. Do have a look at those audiobooks too if you are uh, someone who likes to learn uh, with earphones. Uh, Tipsforlawyers.com slash go slash audible will get you there and you can check that out. That's all I had. Let me know how you get on with your strengths. Shoot me an email uh, in some way, get in touch. And I look forward to hearing from you. And I look forward to seeing you next time.